All right, so let me do an example calculation for you. So considering a, um, a continuous charge distribution, um, and uh, first let me start just by reminding you. So the electric field, um, if I have a continuous distribution of charge, that is some charge density spread in space that's described by a function rho, um, the electric field, which is a function of position of the observer, is the integral over the charge, over the dq. So you integrate each con the contribution from each little dq. If you have a volume distribution, so that it's rho, um, which depends on the location r prime, which I'm going to integrate over, um, there'll be an r hat over where r hat is the distance between the little chunk of charge I'm interested in and my observer location r, um, 4 pi epsilon naught r cubed, oops, r squared, sorry, r squared, um, integrated over the volume element d cubed r prime, okay? Now, if, uh, this is generic, this will work for any situation, but if I have, for instance, a, a situation like I want to go over right now, which is I have a plate, you know, a flat plate that I've spread charge all over, okay? Um, it's I could it's hard to describe. I assume it's a thin plate. I can describe this as a volume a, a charge per unit volume, but it's easier to think about a little bit of charge on this plate as being some surface charge density times the area. Okay, and I can you know I can formally connect those two. Um, I can write it as a volume density using a delta function. Okay, if those of you who know about delta functions, that's how you do it. Um, but we'll skip over that. It's not something I want you to know necessarily. Um, in this case, my little chunk of charge is sigma dA, and the electric field can be written as um, sigma, which may depend on where I am in space, um, times r hat over 4 pi epsilon naught. Um, r squared, and then I'm integrating over the area element dA prime, okay? Um, all right, so let's let's do that, okay? And then I could write down for a line, too. We'll the line's done in the book. We might go over it in class, but there you're going to have some charge painted over a wire, for example. There'll be a charge per unit length. Sigma's a charge per unit area. So charge per unit length times dL, which is the length that I'm integrating over, and then I have a Anyway, that's how you do it for a line. But let's let's take the case for uh, um, let's do this uh, plate case. Let me draw it again here. Um, now, to calculate the field anywhere in space for the plate is not trivial. Okay, we're going to compute it just for um, points on the axis of the plate. In other words, the line that cuts through the, that's normal to the plate but cuts through the center. Okay, and it turns out this calculation is a little less stressful to do. Okay, so what we're going to be doing is we'll consider that the plate is uniformly charged with charge sigma, uh, charge density sigma, which is the total charge on the plate, we'll call it capital Q, divided by the area of the plate. So it's uniformly spread, sigma is Q over A. I want to know the electric field at this location here, and I'll call um, the distance from the center of the plate Z. So this will be my Z direction here. Um, now we can, you always start these kind of problems off by guessing what it's going to look like. You use your intuition first, okay? Now if I, if I were to place, so if this is, let's imagine, I can, I can specify it either way, if Q is positive um, and I place a, um, a positive charge here, I know the force is going to be uh, straight up, okay? Now the reason I know that is by symmetry. We'll be talking a lot about symmetry in class as we do these kind of problems. But I know that, say, this piece of the plate over here will provide a force that will look something like that on a charge that we're sitting there. This bit will provide a force that looks something like that. And I can go all the way around the edge of the plate and do this for all the uh, different chunks of charge I might pick out. Um, but the bottom line is, when I'm, if I'm sitting at this location and looking down at the plate, I see no difference in any direction um, perpendicular to, to this line. Okay. So no matter which direction I look, this way, that way, or if I look you know, out of the page, into the page, the plate looks the same to me. So there's no reason that the plate would tend to force me off of this line. 
if I'm sitting here. So by symmetry, for that reason, or just by thinking about adding up all these vectors that I drew earlier, you're going to find the force is going to be exactly along this line. Okay? And that, it turns out, will simplify our calculation tremendously because we can just argue, I know the force in the direction that's not z has to be zero, so I'm not even going to bother to calculate it. Now, you can calculate it and prove to yourself that it's zero, but by symmetry of this system, you know it can't point anywhere except for along the z-axis. Okay? Now, if I move somewhere else, if I tell you to calculate the electric field over here, that argument no longer holds, and so I'm going to have to calculate all components of the electric field, and it's going to be a messy calculation. Okay, um, but we're not going to do that here. Okay, so we're going to stick to, I've made it messy now, we're going to stick to calculating along this line. And I'll tell you what, let me go to the next page and redraw. So we have a clear starting point. So, um, okay, here's my plate. Um, I have, oops, that's supposed to be on the axis. Uh, okay, on the axis of the plate. Here's my observation location. I'm going to call the distance up z. Um, now, uh, so my observer location is always at z. Now, my the, I'm going to integrate the contributions from all the little chunks of charge on the plate. So let's pick one out here. Let's call this little bit of charge sitting at position uh, r prime. Okay, where I've, you know, by default, I'm looking at a cylindrical coordinate system here. So R and Z are part of a cylindrical coordinate system. I also have a theta coordinate, or phi, or whatever you want to call it, um, that goes around in this direction. Okay, but I've picked out my little bit of charge that's sitting there. And so the electric field at location Z, what we need to do is calculate um, this vector here. This is the vector that matters. That's what I would call r, okay, the, distance, the, the vector that points from the chunk of charge to the observation location. And r vector in this case is going to be um, z, z hat, okay. Now it's going to be minus r prime r hat, okay. And that describes that vector r. Um, and so I can write it here. Now my integral is going to be over area. Okay, so let me just leave it um, uh, the integral part arbitrary for now. So I'm going to have sigma times dA. I'm going to define the area element in a second. And I'm going to have 4 pi epsilon naught. Uh, here, I'll just write this out for now. Okay. So that's what I'm going to want to integrate, but now let me specify all these things. So our vector I've specified, um, if I write down r hat over r squared, um, this is going to be z, z hat minus r prime r hat over, um, and now what I'm doing is I've written r here, and remember I can write r hat over r squared, it's the same as r vector over r cubed, so I can write this as z squared plus r prime squared to the 3 halves power, okay? And that's going to be my, you know, my r hat over r squared, which is going to be the you know, most of the complication here. Now, um, oops, the area element here, so again, I'm integrating my area, I should be clear, this is over the prime quantities, okay? Um, my area element is just going to be a little cylindrical area element, which I could write as r times d theta times dr. Okay, that's going to be my, and I should prime all these things. Okay, so dA prime equals that. Um, now, because I because of symmetry, I know that there is no dependence anywhere in this integral that I'm going to do. Um, on the angle theta, okay? So the, the disk uh, density doesn't vary with theta. My vector r um, doesn't vary with theta. It depends on r hat and, um, and z, okay? Um, so what I can do is I can just go ahead and do the integral over theta, and I'm going to end up with a 2 pi, okay? And then I just need to integrate over r. So let me write that down. So my e as a function of z now is going to be just an integral over r. It would be a two-dimensional integral because it's an area integral, but I've, I'm going to go ahead and integrate out the theta part, and I'm going to integrate from zero to the size of the disk, and let me say, I didn't say it yet, but let's say that the disk has a radius a. Okay, 
So we're going to go up here and say that the whole disk, if I go all the way out to here, that length is A. Okay, so I integrate from 0 to A, um, and I get sigma times 2 pi r prime dr prime, okay, divided by 4 pi epsilon naught, and then I'm going to have my z, z hat, minus r prime r hat over z squared plus r prime squared to the 3 halves power. Okay? All right. Now, as I argued before, and it may not be um, apparent from this um, expression. I'll keep doing that. Sorry. Here we go. Um, but I know that the, the answer can't have an r hat in it. Okay, because we just argued by symmetry the force, the electric field and the force that would result if I put a particle on the axis has to point only along the z direction. There's no way it could point left or right by symmetry. So I know that the r hat component here has to integrate out to zero. Okay. Um, now I'm not going to prove that for you here. I'm just going to assert that that's true by symmetry. Um, and what's left over then is just the z hat component. So the integral that I am asked to do, um, and so by symmetry, I ignore everything multiplying um, the r hat. Okay, because I know the answer's got to be zero there. And again, you can prove it to yourself if you like. So the integral that's left to do is the z hat component. So I'll, let me just do this. Let me say this is going to be the z component of the electric field as a function of the position z along the axis um, will be then uh, z times sigma um, times 2 pi r prime dr prime um, over now z squared plus r prime squared to the 3 halves. Okay? All right, so now you can integrate this. <laughs> I'm not going to do it for you here, but you can show that um, the answer for this integral, I should show it to you here, but I'm not going to, um, EZ is going to be equal to um, sigma Z over uh, 2 epsilon naught minus 1 over z squared plus a squared square root uh, plus 1 over z. Okay? All right. Um, good. So there's your answer. So that's the electric field on axis just from that integral. Now I do want to take a moment to take the limits of this expression. Now it's important because, I, again, I want you to use your intuition. Uh, I want you to know how to do this calculation, but you need to be able to, f to guess what the answer is going to be and then use your intuition to check. Now, um, in, uh, one way to use your intuition is to think about limits of what this thing looks like. So let me do one thing first. Let me rewrite that expression in a, an equivalent way. So I can write down that EZ, just rearranging things a little bit and multiplying through by Z. Um, I can just expose the sigma over 2 epsilon naught and move the Z inside and make it 1 minus 1 over the square root of A squared over Z squared plus 1. Okay? All right, so there's my answer for the electric field along the axis. Now I'm going to take two limits here. Um, now the first limit is if z is much bigger than a. And this is the one that I'm hoping that you guys can tell me. I should, in class, I would ask you what you think it would look like. And um, we'll talk about this in class in other contexts. But if I'm very far away, if z is much bigger than the size of the disk, and I look at it, um, to me, it's going to look like a point in space. If I go really far away, I'm not going to know it's a plate. It's going to just look like a point on the horizon or a point very far away. So the thing better act like a point charge at that point, okay? Because to me, it looks like a point charge. So when I'm very far away from it, it's going to look like the electric field of a point charge. And let's confirm that. So I take the limits where um, A is small, 
okay, compared, or sorry, uh, yeah, A is small compared to C. Um, what I'm going to do is take this term here. So that term I can rewrite as A squared over Z squared plus 1 to the minus 1 half. Okay, now A over Z is small, so this is approximately by binomial expansion. It's going to be 1 minus 1 half A squared over Z squared. Okay, all right, so if you don't remember that binomial expansion, go look it up again. There'll be other terms, but I'm going to argue they're small compared to this leading order term. Okay, and so if I plug that back in to, um, to this second term here, Okay. What I can show is that EZ in that limit, where I'm far, far away, is approximately sigma over 2 epsilon naught times 1 half A squared over Z squared, or this is sigma A squared over 4 um, epsilon naught Z squared. And if I recognize that sigma times pi a squared is the same as the total charge on the disk, I can write this as q over 4 pi epsilon naught z squared. Okay, and that's, that's exactly the field of a point charge. Okay, exactly. It's an approximate answer, but it looks like a point charge. And that's what I would expect. If I'm very far away, so I'm far compared to the size of the object, it's going to look to me like it's a point object. And it should have a field that looks like a point charge, and that's what I find here. Okay. Um, now, the other limit we don't know the answer to yet. We're going to, tr when we talk about Gauss's law, there's going to be an easier way to calculate the field of an infinite plane of charge. And if I take the other limit so that z is very small compared to a, that means I'm right next to the plate. And I'm standing, you know, right on the plate. And if I look to the left and to the right, the plate looks very big to me. Okay? It seems to go on forever if I'm really close. Okay? Um, so in that limit, it looks like an infinite plane of charge. And we don't know the answer to the infinite plane of charge yet, but we're going to calculate it next week. And um, if we take that same limit, the second term here, um, this just goes to um, to zero here. Okay, so this term here, oops, here, um, is just going to go to zero in that limit. Okay, and I hope you can see that. So basically, a is very big, so the denominator becomes very big, and I can ignore it relative to one. And so in that limit, I have e z is approximately sigma over two epsilon naught, and that's that is that it's independent of height, which is an interesting result, okay? Um, and we'll talk more about why an infinite sheet of charge would have an electric field that's independent of height um, later on, okay? Uh, all right, so just an example of how to do a calculation of the electric field. Um, the trick is you have a vector in there that you have to sum, and you have different components you have to integrate over. Um, and, and a skill that you should acquire and develop is looking for symmetry to make arguments about what direction the electric field should point um, in order to make your calculation easier. Okay? All right, I'll stop there.